Overall, the composition of sediment depends on the rock that's breaking down into the grains, the weathering processes that are acting on that rock, and then the transport of those grains and the weathering processes that happen along the transport path. So when we're looking at the composition of sediment, we can tell uh, various amounts about the original rock and the transport processes and weathering processes. If a rock is mostly being physically weathered and just breaking down into smaller pieces, the composition of the sediment mirrors that of the original rock. So for example, if you have a granite um, that contains um, quartz and uh, sodium and potassium feldspar and biotite, the sediment that's produced will be class of granite, and when you have class of the original rock with multiple minerals, and then we call them lithic classes. Um, and then, uh, because it's coarse grained, the individual minerals can also break out, and you would expect to have sand grains, because um, it's coarse grained, of quartz, of uh, feldspar, and biotite, for example. So when you have uh, physical weathering processes, the sediment mirrors the composition of the original host rock. The different grains can abrade differently, and so you can lose some of the softer grains during abrasion during transport. In contrast to physical weathering, in, during chemical weathering, you're transforming the rock composition, and so it's harder to tell what the original rock type was. There are some minerals in rocks, however, that are very resistant to chemical weathering and they don't dissolve and they don't alter very easily. And so those grains tend to persist during the transport process um, and form the bulk of, of sedimentary grains when you have a lot of chemical weathering. In contrast, there are other grains that are more reactive and those are the ones that disappear and um, new minerals form um, when they're being altered. So we can look at uh, minerals that are common in uh, igneous rocks, uh, for example, and, and look at their propensity uh, to react and alter into new grains. So we'll start with the most reactive ones. And we're going to go down to least reactive. So one of the most uh, reactive minerals is olivine, uh, particularly the type with iron in it. Um, olivine is stable at high uh, pressures and temperatures and not very stable at low temperatures, low pressure, and, and, the, and in the presence of water. The iron-rich olivine in particular has reduced iron, and so if there's oxygen around, it'll react as well. Plagioclase or uh, calcium feldspar is also very reactive and it reacts um, to clay. Again, it's a high temperature, high pressure mineral. Pyroxene, again, the same way. These, these uh, mafic uh, minerals are not very stable in the presence of, of, of water. Amphiboles are common uh, metamorphic minerals, and it depends a lot on the details of their composition, how stable they are. They already are a little bit hydrous, and so they, they tend to be a little bit um, uh, more stable. So then, um, uh, sodium feldspars tend to again uh, re react um, with the water, but not as much as the calcium feldspars. Biotite is a mica with iron in it, and the oxidation of that iron in the presence of oxygen makes it a little less stable. A potassium uh, feldspar uh, is next on the list. Muscovite, again, another mica, but without the iron, it's a little bit more stable. And then the most stable common mineral uh, against chemical weathering is quartz. And so in an environment where you have chemical weathering going on, these um, minerals are least likely uh, to persist, and quartz is the most likely to persist. So uh, in general, on Earth, 
we have a, quite a bit of chemical weathering and quartz is uh, one of the most common sedimentary grains that are present. Thanks for watching.